Okay, my name is Paul Franson. I'm a research data scientist uh, for the Smithsonian Office of the Chief Information Officer. I've been at the Smithsonian for a couple years. And I also do research with the folks in the entomology department uh, in the Natural History Museum here. And that's going to be the subject of my talk today. I'll be telling a little bit about the research that I've been doing on caddisflies, um, which we refer to as nature's underwater architects, and how we're uh, working to decipher the tree of life of caddisflies. And so I'd like to start by briefly kind of examining my motivations for pursuing this research. Here are a couple of museum drawers taken from the entomology collection here. And to probably most of you, this might look like a couple boxes full of little brown things. Uh, but to me, it represents kind of a vast variety of species, uh, diversity in form, in color, in size. And then if you looked at the labels, you'd be able to tell differences in uh, timing of emergence, uh, when they were collected, uh, geography, et, et cetera. And so this diversity is really fascinating to me, and I want to understand kind of the processes that uh, structure the diversity and how that diversity arose. And, and the first step towards doing that is to place it all into context with a phylogenetic tree. So caddisflies uh, are the insect order Trichoptera, are an understudied group. There's about 15,000 named species. Um, they're well known amongst professional and amateur entomologists alike because they have this kind of remarkable ability to uh, use silk underwater to construct fixed uh, retreats and then and these tube cases. Um, they've also caught the attention of biomedical researchers recently who are kind of inspired by the structure of the silk that's so strong and durable underwater and want to use it to uh, make better surgical adhesives. They're also important uh, for freshwater biomonitoring. Uh, they're differentially as sensitive to pollution levels, uh, which makes them ideal to kind of judge the health of streams in other freshwater environments. And here we are in uh, Mongolia, where we were working with uh, our colleagues in Mongolia to implement freshwater biomonitoring protocols uh, for their freshwater ecosystems. The caddisflies are broken up into three different suborders, uh, which are characterized by different case-making behaviors. So the first are the Integra palpia, which are the tube case makers. As you can see, they use silk to uh, grab just about anything to make a case from these highly structured um, rocks and pebbles and twigs uh, to these really irregular cases that even include snail shells. And folks also have found out that they will make cases out of gold, and so they've used them for jewelry and for art. The next suborder is the annu annu annulopalpia. These are the fixed retreat and net spinning caddisflies. And they kind of have this marvelous ability to create these really interesting architectures that have sophisticated filtration systems to help them uh, both get food and to have water come through their gills. And here are some pictures of them uh, who have constructed this. And this is the silk that they've used to, to capture their food. And then lastly, there are the spicopalpia, which is just about everything else. Uh, there are very different uh, behaviors in the spicopalpia, range from free living uh, to tortoise shell makers to purse case makers. Um, as you can see here, here are some images. Uh, this is a tortoise shell maker, which has a plastron, and it, it, it's not homologous with the other tube case making caddisflies. So just about every combination of relationships has been proposed for the caddisflies and the relationships among the suborders and families within them. And so in an attempt to resolve kind of this dispute about the early evolution of caddisflies, we've taken a lot of different data sets. And so in general, we have a little bit of data for a lot of specimens, such as the DNA barcode, which for which we have 40,000 individuals uh, genotyped. And then we have a lot of data for fewer specimens, such as transcriptomes. And just a little bit about each of these data types. Uh, the first is transcriptomes. We all know the central dogma of molecular biology, that there is DNA, which is transcribed into RNA, which is translated into protein. This is my uh, little schematic. And uh, so the transcriptome is all of the RNA in an organism at time of collection. And so it's a way to get a lot of DNA or a lot of data for cheap. Uh, however, you need to catch these specimens alive. They're not always easy to identify. So in order to make use of the museum collections uh, that have spent you know, lots of money and time curating, we're also using exon capture methods, which is another way to get a lot of DNA uh, from older specimens. 
And then lastly, we have this really remarkable resource of DNA barcodes, uh, which has also been a lot of people have spent a lot of time on. DNA barcodes were originally meant for species identification, but we are hoping to use them uh, to help inform a, a hypothesis of phylogeny as well. So the big question is, can we use all of these different data in our quest to generate a comprehensive caddisfly tree of life? And I think so, and this is what we've done so far. So we've used the exon capture and transcriptome data to create a scaffold, a well-resolved scaffold, among the, which shows the relationships among the suborders and the families within the spicopalpia. And then we're taking the barcodes, which have been collected from all throughout the world, and grafting them onto that scaffold. And the resulting tree is really remarkable, a gigantic uh, tree with tens of thousands of tips, um, and kind of gives us the first hypothesis for how the evolution of caddis flies uh, came to be. And we can use this tree to make inferences on those things that I was passionate about with those first couple museum drawers. With that, I would like to thank my collaborators and funding sources, and thank you for listening. You use the entomology collection a lot for the sequence data uh, in this project. Do you envision any other future uses for it? Yeah, definitely. So I think the uh, entomology collection has a lot of other data, including, you know, geography data, you can look at the specimens themselves for morphology, and really this is just the first step to kind of understand evolution. Integrating all those data sources in the end is, uh, would be really powerful, I think. I like caddis flies. So most entomologists have some story about how they're really into bugs as a kid. I don't have that story. Um, I was going to be a dentist, and so <laughs> I uh, decided to do research because I wanted a letter of recommendation, and then Suddenly, I was put in this lab studying insects, and the minute that I saw an insect underneath a microscope, it just really captured my interest, and ever since, I've uh, really loved insects. Christopher Paul, uh, I'll shout. Uh, how confident are you with the phylogenetic resolution at the tips provided by your CO1 data? And in cases where you have other forms of data at that level, are you finding any conflicts? Okay, yeah, that's a great question. So. Um, we are cautiously optimistic about some of the CO1. Um, the support values kind of tell a good story, I think, with the uh, CO1 data at the tips. Many of the support values are very low, and uh, I would kind of exercise caution with those. But the limitations with CO1 are kind of well described uh, for deep level phylogeny or any sort of phylogeny. Um, but kind of our goal was to, you know, there's a kind of this really great community of taxonomists that work on Trichoptera, including many people who do it on the amateur level. And so our goal with this tree, the, f the first step was to help give them something to guide their classifications when they're describing species. Um, we did make a CO1 only tree without the backbone. And it did surprisingly well, but there were several kind of, especially deep in the tree, several incongruences between the two. And I think we would definitely trust the tree, the backbone tree that we got from the bigger data sets uh, more. Does that answer your questions? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, ideally we'd have, you know, three or four loci for each of those 40,000 individuals or something like that, and that would give us a much better idea of the, uh, the tip phylogenies. But hopefully this will at least allow us, give us a place to, you know, focus on for further work.